Welcome to the Coffee Break Show. I'm so excited for you. Today, we are going to blow your socks off. We are on the trail of learning about personal nonfiction branding with DPE. Is it Knutin? You got it right. Thank See, you this so is much. Knutin. So now, before we even start the show, you guys know what we got to do. We got to listen to the music. I'll see you in a second. You're on the Success Secrets for Business, Family, and Life channel. My name is Vicki Helm. You guys know who I am. This is D.P. Newton. Today, we are going to be talking about personal branding. Now, I want to tell you about this guy right up front. This guy has over 30 years in advertising. He is somebody that is an expert in this field. We are going to have a fun conversation today about something that is so important for you to know. So I want to let you know, this is brought to you by the Metadime Digital Network. And today I just want to say welcome to the show first off. Oh, and thanks uh, for, having thanks me, for being Vicky. here. Now, yeah. I just want to say we have had already had a fun conversation uh, because we have a lot in common in today. But so before the show, we were already gearing up having a lot of fun. But today I want to start including you into the conversation. And first, what I want to hear, and and here is, this is good morning and welcome, DP. Good morning. <laughs> and do you have, do you have, do you just go by? I have a friend who's JT, and he goes by JT. And do you go by DP? Is that like JT? You go by DP? Yeah, I do. And there's a, a little bit of a story to that, uh, and I'll keep it short, just by saying DP stands for David Paul or David Dark Paul. Prince, depending Dark on my Prince. moods. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, today you're getting David Paul and not the Dark Prince. Okay, so I see you guys all popping on. Do me a favor and put your name down below and be part of the conversation as we go in today. So I want to talk about, first off, how did you make the switch and why did you make the switch from advertising to personal branding and nonfiction personal branding? And I want a little more explanation about what that is and means to you. And I just want to say, Lisa, I see you on. Nice to see you, girlfriend. Thank you for being here. I'm popping on. Good morning. Good morning, you guys. I see you popping on. I'm going to start with a conversation. I asked him some questions. Join in and he can answer your questions as well if you have any. Welcome. I'm sorry. Let's go with that now. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Uh, you asked me a couple of questions. One, uh, why did I get involved with personal branding? And two, why is the nonfiction branding part of it so important? And let me answer the second question first, which is, I'll be honest with you. During my career, I've worked on clients big and small, you know, multinational, international brands like Coca-Cola to tiny brands you've never heard of and everything in between. But there's another pair of continuum poles that I've worked for those that are incredibly authentic, true, genuine to what they do, mm -hmm. how they do it and who they are. And then some brands who are all what I like to call fronters, which is we front this way. We present oh, yeah. ourselves this way. But the second you deal with us, uh, it ain't quite all that. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking Absolutely. about the, the fake brands that surround us every single day. And I'm at the point in my life where I get to choose what I want to work on. Yeah. I don't want to work on fronters. I don't want to work with people who are authentic, genuine, completely. I love to put it this way. They're completely true and completely you when it comes to who they are, what they do and how they do it. I've had it with fakers. That's so, that is so powerful. And I'm so glad that you said I've had it with fakers because we're inundated with fake influencers, fake gurus, fake teachers. And it's like, how do you discern yourself as a personal brand? How do you discern yourself away from that and just be the authentic brand that you are? I mean, what are the things that you do in order to uh, create that? Well, first of all, you got to know who you are. And mm -hmm. one of the bumper stickers that if I sold them, you could buy would be know who you are so you can be it. It's very yes. important. A lot of people are being things that frankly, they are not. They're being things because they see 
key influencers in their life being that way. And they think, oh, I got to be that way. For example, myself, I'm male. I'm an, a white American and I want to be kind of loud and uh, heard and recognized by people. Hmm. Who might I like to be like? <laughs> Some people would say, oh, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, right? Because mm -hmm. that guy is bald. And loud you know, and he is bald to the wall. Yep. Exactly. And the fact is, I'm not like him at all when it comes to his style, his personality. I think he's absolutely true to who he is. I agree with that. But, but copying I, him is hard. Exactly. But he's yeah. surrounded by how many legions of 25-year-old yeah. guys who want to be the next Gary V. Yeah, it's true. Instead of being the first them. Yep. Personal and branding is not about being like someone else. It's it's about being the one of one that is you, the truly unique person. The only thing you truly own is your experience, your expertise, your story, great. and your voice. That's what that. personal branding is about, getting and those that, things out there. That is so important what you just said, because, you know, part of the reason I think people want to be somebody else is because they don't trust or know who they are. They don't trust themselves. And I see you guys coming on. I want to pop this up. Uh, my better half right here. Here it is. Right. So tired of people with people in the front of the expensive cars, the planes, the homes. And they're like, I rented this for this video that I'm going to show you. And it's just absolute, you know, garbage. Word. <laughs> garbage. garbage. Thank you. It's, just, it's funny, Robin. I love the fact that you brought this up because I call those pictures me in front of a fat stack of cash on my Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. And then the downloadable thing you can get from me is five simple ways to get a seven figure income in two days. Yeah. Garbage, 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 garbage. Now I would use a different word personally. Yeah, but we're on, we're on live now. So we're going to use garbage. <laughs> right. And I'm not Gary Vee. So I'm not dropping F bombs every two and a half seconds. <laughs> yeah. I know. And sometimes when we get to the point where we see somebody in that way, we're like the, the thing that's there for people in branding is how can I be heard in the attention ring if I'm just myself? And you want to ask that question really important because you know what? I want to talk about the audience. I want to ask your opinion because I know for myself, I have what I call a BS detector for lack of cuss words. That BS detector is exactly, MJ, nice to see you. Good morning. But this is it right here. My BS detector is constantly looking for this in every ad, every connection, every everything. I'm looking for hashtag authenticity. And tell me a little bit about the audience or the people that we are talking with. Do they walk around with that kind of feeling? What's your experience in the industry about people uh, and why this authenticity works? Well, okay. Number one, we all have a BS detector. Yep. And anyone who's lived as long as I have has finally calibrated that detector mm -hmm. so that it smells a molecule of <laughs> BS from 50 miles away. And if you work in marketing, it's even more acutely attuned because as I like to say to people, uh, as a copywriter and a creative director, I'm not afraid of taking something and polishing it to as high a sheen as mm -hmm. it can possibly handle. But I do recognize that sometimes when you've got a certain turd of an idea, polishing is not going to help. All you're going to do is smear it all over the place. The goal here is get rid of the turd and find out the truth and then tell the truth. Now, here's the thing. Love when that. it comes to audience, not all audiences even want the truth. Ooh, Can you handle we are that headed truth? down there. Ooh, we are saying more about that. Well, and let me give you an example. What is the thing that is sold more than anything else on Facebook, and yet everyone ad really admits they don't work? Diets. Oh, Dieting doesn't work. Yep. It's really a very simple equation. If you burn more calories than you ingest, you're going to lose weight. 
If you eat more calories than you burn during the day, you're going to put on weight. Now, again, if, if you buy any of these diet things and buy their food program, you'll lose weight as long as you do only what they that, give you. When you which go back is, to what your old habit was. Poof, exactly. And then back. you'll drift yep. back. Why? Because they've not changed your behavior long term. They've changed it for a short period of time. Yeah, you got that you know, right. Exactly. So when it comes to the authenticity question, here's the reality. Your authenticity, your genuine, your, your valuable thing is probably going to be different than mine. And let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows the brand Rolex, right? You can get a solid gold Rolex for twenty to forty thousand dollars, or you can get a Timex Ironman watch that gives you everything short of nuclear launch codes. Now, which one is more valuable? Well, a certain audience is going to say, "Well, the Rolex is. It costs twenty-five to forty thousand dollars." Perception. But then I say, yeah, well, let's put an audience filter on that and say you're an active triathlete. Which watch is more valuable to you? If you go out and you train every single day and you want to know that you're actually training and getting better, is lugging around a solid gold Rolex going to help you at all? Or is that Timex Ironman that you got at Walmart for $25 going to be actually more valuable to you? Mm. Audiences get to determine what's valuable. Mm -hmm. brands have to present their truth in a way that it attracts an audience that appreciates what they have to offer. So I'm telling you right now, I will never own a Rolex in my life, but wow. I will have an Apple watch, which I'm sporting right now because <laughs> it does everything I want and more. And it exists with all my equipment and full disclosure, I own Apple stock. That's how much <laughs> I love that brand called Apple. Yeah. Engineers I know think I'm insane <laughs> because they'll say, they, and I've, they've, they've literally said, why would you pay $900 for a phone that has $125 worth of components in it? And to them, I say, oh, you're missing the value proposition, my engineering friend. It's not just the components of the phone. It's the fact that my phone talks to my watch, talks to my MacBook Pro, which I'm using right now, which mm -hmm. talks to every other uh, Apple product in the house seamlessly without yeah. me ever touching a config.sys file. If you're old enough, if you're a DOS, if you remember DOS, you know, yeah, I do. Day, MS DOS, you would know what a config.sys file was because whenever you had to get a new printer, you had to go into that file and change some crap. <laughs> I am old enough. To never to want to touch a config.sys file again. I'm old enough now to want the hood of my car to be welded shut because I don't want to have to mess with it. I used to tweak my cars. I don't anymore. I'm a different audience. I want something that will just work, which is why I appreciate the brand called Apple. I, I think this is, uh, <laughs> look at this. Somebody's already, look at this. A Mac mate. Hello. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this I want to talk about because some brands are just there because they do. They create a status symbol and a status symbol, status matters more for some. I get that. I get that. But that's still, to me, uh, if somebody's wrapped up in status, you know, I have this because it gives me status instead of performance or how it benefits you or how it's great for you. And the status is the brand name. This is the whole point where I want to make the dividing line right here because a brand represents some form of status, whether that status is, oh, I'm an economical brand or, oh, I'm a luxury brand and authenticity within, within that. So when we take a look at that, uh, hey, Wendy, nice to see you on. Um, when we take a look at having the status brand or creating a type of status with your personal brand, what are some of the things like, let's say right now, DP, I'm starting. I know myself. I know what my product is, but I want a certain audience and I want my brand to appeal to that audience. And how is it that I can remain authentic and still attract the audience that I want to attract? 
Well, trying to find that audience brand alignment thing is really the the secret of effective branding and marketing. Mm -hmm. But here's the reality. I can want all day long to attract an audience of Hollywood agents to put me in the next Fast and Furious m movie. <laughs> if I don't fit that, that audience has the right to use their BS detector and go, dude, you are you so not that. a matinee idol who looks like he could <laughs> handle a car at high speeds. We're not putting you in this movie. Sorry, dude. So the reality is I can attract and satisfactorily serve only those people who actually want what I have to offer. And that's hard for a lot of people to understand. Let me use an, I love to yes. use analogies because that's the way my brain works. A lot of people, especially people that are solopreneurs or small business people think they need to be all things to all people. And so they become what I think of as an equivalent of a Swiss army knife. Well, the reality of a Swiss army knife is it's a crappy knife. It's a crappy corkscrew. It's a, and it's an unsanitary toothpick. <laughs> it, it does none of those things to, a, to a level of excellence. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet everyone thinks, well, I got to be everything to everybody. I've got to be all things to all people. And the reality is, no, because the only way for you to actually make money over your career at a higher level is to become really, really good at what, get this, you're yes. actually good at. That's right. Master it. Yeah. Well, and uh, I'm sure members of your audience are familiar with Pat Flynn's Smart Passive Income Podcast. Oh, of which course. I, I love that. It's like yeah, one of my he's, faves. He's, he's, great. he's an example right there. Okay. Yeah. Because here's this guy and I've met him personally and he's a really nice guy and I'm not yeah. picking on him. But if you were casting uh, someone that would have an, an international following in business mm -hmm. and you said, send me over some headshots, Pat Flynn's <laughs> would be the last one you would accept or look at. Why? True. Because he's this, nah, I'm, I'm a regular guy. He is. And you listen to his podcast and you hear his regular guy voice. And yeah. he's asking regular guy questions that happen to be really smart and the same uh -huh. ones I want to know about. And he happens to have on guests that are really interesting that he curates because he invites mm -hmm. them on, therefore indicating that he's a really smart curator of guests and valuable information. Mm -hmm. He's building his brand like this to the point where you go, Pat Flynn, I'd never cast you in a feature film, but I want to hear more about how you do things so I can have a smart passive income business. Do you see what he's doing? Yeah. And the you know, this podcast, smart passive, passive income. income. I podcast I, does not say seven figures in two and a half weeks. That's right. And I have followed him since the very beginning. I remember I have followed him for years and years and years. But what I liked about him was his transparency. It, yeah. In the beginning, in his early shows, he would show you what he sold per month. He show you all of his receipts. He would show you how we did it so that you could literally follow along with him. And he was authentic and transparent. And that's why he attracted some of the top business professionals in the industry as well. But you're right. He was a great filter, too, because I think his BS detector said, nope, you can't be on my show. You don't represent um, you know, that level of authenticity. And I think there's a lot, a lot of podcasters, a lot of people out there who have shows that are doing these things that are so um, reliant on stuff that isn't true. And I want to talk about this right here, because there is this, there is this, um, I don't know, trend where you're always trying to get the high ticket client, go yeah. get a high ticket client, high ticket client, high ticket client. I don't necessarily want high ticket clients. I want consistent clients that are in love with working with us in our systems. And I want a long-term client. I don't want a one-off high ticket client. I want that long-term client. And I have built that brand piece around that. And I want to actually ask you, you know, the difference between the high ticket client and the long term client and how you go about getting those. And I also want to say good morning, Amber. Nice to see you on. Well, I, I want to answer that question about high ticket versus what I would call a relationship client. Yeah, that's right. 
let's face it. Okay. Now I've worked for a number of ad agencies. I've worked for a number of companies. I've been in-house. I've been, uh, you know, uh, you name it everywhere. So I've had the luxury of having an experience where I worked at a company where the highest performing salesperson was a rabid badger. I mean, literally he was a jackass and it didn't matter because he was the one who is bringing in, you know, the big sales and all that stuff. And he'd hand it over and treat the people back at the, the, mm. the office like crap. And no one liked him. He was toxic and all this stuff. And the company was fine with that because he was as a salesperson bringing in those solo big jobs or projects. New yeah. person comes in at the C level, sees what's going on and fires that salesperson because that salesperson who was in it for one transaction did not realize that a lifetime of multiple transactions, no matter how big or small, yep. will always be worth more than that solo transaction. And also that person was destroying the culture inside the business and driving the best performers away. Because here's the thing, when a toxic individual works for a company, you don't keep your best performers. They can go elsewhere. That's you right. Just worse. like that. Exactly. All of a sudden, you've got a, a warehouse of nothing but dead wood because yep. they're afraid to leave because they can't get another job because they don't perform well. The ones yep. who actually have a sense of confidence and actually perform well, they say, I don't need this. I'm Amen. going elsewhere. And so what I've just illustrated there is the combination of brand and culture. Is there a difference? Yes, there is. But it comes down to this, in my humble opinion. Brands say, cultures do. Brands yes. say, we are this way. This is what matters to us. These are our, our key principles, all this stuff. But if the culture doesn't do that, that's a lie. And that's where nonfiction branding is about aligning those two things. Your brand is your culture. Your culture is your brand. And Tony Heisch came to mind. Yeah. Great, yeah. late, great Tony Heisch with the Zappo shoes in the beginning. Exactly. Yes. That exactly. is the, that's the key to doing that. So let's say right now, let's get nitty gritty. Hey, Amber, thank you. I, I'm just going to pop this up. Yes. Thank you for saying that so often. So much hype on the HT without regard to the fit. Yes. yes. And that is so interesting. So <clears throat> I want to uh, continue this conversation. I want to take it a little bit deeper. You're working with a new client, solopreneur company. I don't care what it is. And they're just starting out. They present their, their value and they have this great product, et cetera. The first three things, the first three questions, you're going to ask them about how to develop their nonfiction brand and culture. What would you say to them? What would you ask them? Well, I'm going to ask them, what do you value most in life? Not in terms of business, but in terms of being a human being on the face of this earth. Mm -hmm. Or put another way, what is your yardstick? And I use the term yardstick regardless of where you are in the world because a yardstick is what you use to measure things. What's your yardstick? Some people will say, well, I was uh, raised in a very poor environment. Money has always been a signal to me of attainment, of, of success. Money is the most important thing. Great. I'm not here to say that's a, a bad yardstick. I'm just, I'm glad to hear you say that's the most important thing to you. Another person might say, I want to build a company that will be sustainable and scalable so that my children and their children can yeah. uh, have a future within mm -hmm. the same firm. I say, fantastic, you now have your prime yardstick. Someone else might say, I want to become internationally known as quickly as possible. Again, not my cup of tea, but also not my job to say your yardstick is wrong. It's more important for me to identify what that yardstick is with you so that we can now build a brand that helps you achieve that. Because here's the thing, your yardstick is a direct reflection on who you are. And again, mm. let's go back to the person who wants to make money. Oh, money's more important than personal relationships and having a family. I know plenty of people who've made that trade off, which is, yeah, I want to live in a part in an apartment in New York, be able to buy whatever I want, whenever I want, and only see family on yeah. Thanksgiving and Christmas. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. That's totally different than me. 
I live in Wisconsin, right outside of the capital city of Madison, Wisconsin. It's kind of the middle of the middle and kind of north. <laughs> I am, you know, if you're a Star Wars fan, I like to say that I'm kind of as far away from the white hot center of the universe as <laughs> Luke Skywalker on Tatooine. I mean, the only thing we don't have is twin suns because right now it's freezing outside. But that's okay because that's aligned with me and my yardstick. The most, if you ask me, what's your yardstick? I'll say that when I come home or when I am home, especially now during COVID, I am surrounded by family. And why do I say that? During my 20s, what I like to call my nebulous 20s, after I had gotten a degree in theater <laughs> and was a jobbing actor and voiceover artist and on camera and all that stuff, and dating like a maniac, I thought I was one way and it never felt right. Mm -hmm. Around the age 30, I thought to myself, you know what? I, want, I really want to have a family. My yardstick was having a family that I could grow and build in, in association with mm -hmm. my wife that, was, that could actually heal some of the wounds I have going all the way back to yeah. when I was a kid. And we don't need to go there because yeah, that course. would be another five-hour episode. <laughs> but, but let's just say that I decided what happened uh, then was going to stay then and not continue mm -hmm. forward. Consequently, my yardstick was all about doing things to build a firm family foundation. I moved when we had to move, partly because my wife got a new job out of state. Did I complain? No, because I love the excitement of moving. And that's part of my entrepreneurialness. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. start over someplace new? Great, let's, let's try it, let's see. I wasn't afraid of that because of who I am and what I was trying to do. My yardstick was with her. So wherever she Beautiful. was, I'm going with her. Now, I'm happy to say that I've got three daughters and they're all nice. in college now. <laughs> but in the and one of them just graduated. The oldest just graduated. But let me tell you, I couldn't be happier because guess where they all are right now today? They're in our house with us during the holiday break. They're nice. not going skiing with friends. They're mm -hmm. not doing whatever. They came home because home is their safe haven. Oh, have I achieved that? <laughs> the which goal that you wanted. wanted. Yep. That's yeah, right. That's your exactly. yardstick. I drive and people don't need to know this, but I'm going to tell you, I drive a 2005 Honda Accord, not because I can't afford a better car. I, I, I couldn't afford a Lamborghini with fat stacks of cash on it, but I could <laughs> afford a better car than that. I choose not to because that's not my yardstick. I totally are, get that. I totally there, get that so much. You yeah. know, I just want to pop in. Uh, Amber, I really appreciate the space and the place for each other's yardsticks. Me too. I really like that. This is an appreciation for what you want in life. Um, and I also want to talk about, you know, sometimes when you're out there trying to be an influencer, you're sending the wrong message out to your audience. So many people out there are not turned on or excited about McMansions and Lamborghinis and the bikinis on the Lamborghinis and the planes and the alcohol. I mean, that's just like a bunch of hunk of junk to us. I'm right with you with the cars. I'm like, you know, as long as it's running, I don't want to go shop and deal with the here, get this car, blah, blah, blah. The car doesn't speak to me like that. Yeah. Um, I'm more of an experienced person. I want to uh, go back to the, because I think what you're saying is so important. As I look while you're talking, I'm reviewing my career and where I have sold out. I did for a very short time. Uh stop entrepreneurship and went to college and got a degree. Mine is in accounting and finance. And I remember I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't yeah. know what I wanted to be. And so the way we discussed what I should pick for college was we got a newspaper and we opened the job section and there was account, 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 and doctor, doctor, and then, you know, little jobs. Um, I actually wanted to be an attorney, but I didn't want to go to eight years of college. Mm -hmm. So I took the accounting route with the finance because that was only four years. I already knew already that I didn't want to go to college. I, I was like, what's the shortest route to get this done? 
And there's places where we abandon ourselves, even though the brand of ourselves is completely different. And I had some miserable years working for other people. I just am not a person who can work for other people. And right. when when you get to the point where you're being honest with the brand of who you are, I believe you can serve people better because part of the brand is essentially people can feel honesty from you. They can just feel it. And so how is it that people can get to the point where they, in order for you to be no, I don't think that's true. There are people who are fake as anything and rich as all get out. But if you want authentic wealth, let's call it that way, authentic freedom, let's call it that as it is, there's a part of me that is hearing from you that inside the personal brand, there's a part of you that you have to, and you've said this earlier, know yourself. Yes. So in order to know yourself, what are some like three or four key things or identifiers where you can say, I, this is me learning about me in such a way that I can follow because they tell you, follow your passion, right? Sometimes your passion isn't going to, you know, get garner you huge amounts of money or make a living that yardstick you just talked about what, you know, what's important to you, what's how you want to live. What are some of the other key things you look at so that people can say, yeah, I know myself a little bit. Like well, at 20, and, you don't know yourself. At, you just don't. You're learning about yourself. Yeah. Well, Vicki, I cannot tell, thank you enough for that question because you just set me up to crush that golf ball 500 yards. Let's do and, it. And that is because you said, what are the, the three or four key things? I have a concept I call the key three. Which is, these are the three words or phrases that very succinctly define who you are, what you do, and how you do it. And let me give you an example in terms of some brands I think we all know. The United States of America is a brand yep. known around the world. You betcha. When we, as a nation, are at our very best, we can be distilled down into three concepts. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Seriously, if you think That's about right. it, everything is, around that is centered on those three concepts. And everybody around the world who comes here, who's breaking down the walls to come here, wants that. I want life. I want liberty. I want to be able to pursue my version of happiness. And again, your yardstick is your version of happiness, right? All right. Yes. So another brand when I worked on in Atlanta, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is nothing but sweet, brown, bubbly water. It's <laughs> a commodity. Most famous. And yet it's yeah. not. It's a brand. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, as a young copywriter we're working on stuff for a Coca-Cola, they would hand my posterior to me on a regular basis because <laughs> they would ask me questions. How does this communicate authenticity? How does it communicate sociability? How does it communicate refreshment? Those were Coca-Cola's three words. If mm. I could not explain in a cogent way and prove that what I was trying to present to them actually covered those three bases, it was dead. It could be the funniest thing. Wow. It could be the most heartwarming thing. It could be if it didn't communicate all three of those things, the ad concept was dead because it wow. wasn't on brand. And that's one of the things I learned there. On brand is an objective measure not a subjective judgment. Is it? Yes, no, on, off. The Supreme Court of the United States of America exists Beautiful. to call balls and strikes. Very that's rarely right. do they do anything that's gray. And most of the time that gray area is, we think the appeals court needs to take a look at this again. The rest of it is, is it constitutional? Is it not? And again, a brand is not the center line of a highway or a tightrope. It is the guardrails that keep you from going off the cliff or into a ditch. Oh, can... God. Did you just hear that? Did you just hear him say that? Well, it, that's because it, you have to have room to maneuver, but always in the same direction you were always going. Now, we've all seen brands that have done a sudden right turn in the middle of the freeway, and you're like, what? Why did you do that? I mean, 
an, an, an example would be Coca-Cola. If you're all about authenticity, and, and why did you come out with new Coke in the mid 80s or the early 80s? <laughs> yeah. And the answer to that is kind of a long question, or but the answer is is very simple. We got scared. That's we right. We got scared because Pepsi came out with the Pepsi Challenge ad commercials. And when we did the same uh, testing ourselves, we discovered the same thing. People prefer the taste of Pepsi. No, they don't. They prefer the sweet taste of Pepsi when you take a sip. But they do not prefer a whole can of Pepsi, especially with food. One of the, and this is not me trying to sell you on Coke, but one of the things about Coke that works so well with food is that it has a little bit of an acidic tartness to it. So it cleans the fat off your tongue. So oh. that if you're, if you are literally having ribs or something like that, you can have a, a sip of Coke, clean your tongue off. So the next bite of ribs tastes as glorious as the first bite of ribs. Wow. Had no idea. I, I don't like soda at all. I'm a coffee drinker. Well, and I don't either. I, <laughs> yeah. But that's cool I'll be to know. With you, I'm a Coke loyalist because. I came from a Pepsi house and I'm a natural contrarian. <laughs> Seriously, I use that. My dad loved Pepsi. Well, I'm going to love Coke because, and then there are a whole lot of other reasons, but it comes down to the fact that, you know what? I'm going to claim that brand is mine and, and make it part of me. Why? Because I like the, the that brand association. I love everything about it. And consequently, I feel that way so much so, and people in the audience may have done this themselves. You go to a restaurant, the server comes up and says, what can I get you to drink? And they, someone says, I'd like a Coke. And they say, I'm sorry, we only serve Pepsi products. Oh, yeah. And somebody says, oh, that's okay, I'll just have water. Yeah, that's Are right. Are you telling me the flavor profile difference is that big that you choose to have water instead of, and the answer is no, they choose not to have somebody else's brand if they can't have theirs. That's right. So that's interesting with the brand loyalty. Listen, we're going to be right back. We have more with D.B. Knuton today, and we're going to be talking about how to authentically brand you. Be right back. What if over the next 14 days, Tracy and I would help you create a launch plan to launch your brand new Facebook live show without you having to think about what type of content to do or where to post it or where together we would build and help you implement a live show launch strategy, plus give you live coaching. And the best part is we won't charge you a dime. Would you take us up on that offer? If you would, just type down below this show, let me in, and we will message you the free link to join our 14-day live show launch accelerator program. Write, let me in right now, and we'll see you on the inside. Okay, let we are in. back. I'm telling, you, I'm telling you, you sold me. Let me in. <laughs> I want to pop over here and just go, uh, oh, that's my goal. Congrats. That's some achievement. Vicki, you always find my kind of people. Yeah, that's right. This is the Coffee Break Show. We have the best experts in the world here. I'm so glad that you're with us. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I know who this is right away. This is definitely Wendy. She is the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. All right, let's go here. Brilliant objective measures, not subjective. Yes, objective measures, uh, not subjective. Blah. There we go with that. We're going to continue on with the conversation right now. We have been taking an in-depth look at what and how to build a personal brand. Now, the thing about this conversation, I think, is that we've taken a very deep dive into personal branding as a reflection of your authenticity and not a reflection of being inauthentic. And I love this conversation that we've been having. We've been talking about the, the last thing that we left off is that people, oh, that's Linda. Thank you, Linda, for that. Thank you for that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is Linda, and I think it's probably Scarab. And thank you for being here. Um, and thank you, Amber, for telling me who it was. So the thing is, I want to continue this conversation because I think the future is now going to be about building a personal brand. I, I think the personal brand, and I don't care whether you're a corporation, one of the things you said about earlier about why the three values were there was to not just 
uh, give you something to talk about, but it is an actual safeguard that your message is exactly what you want it to be and who you are. I mean, this is, this is so important. It's so key to me. And um, I want to talk more about that because if you had to pick three key words that described your brand or someone had to pick three keywords that describe their brand uh, because they're starting out, what are the key values? Because I just heard three key values and on not keywords because keywords go into Google so you can find it. But key values are different. They're the guiding principles of your own personal brand. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would uh, call them key concepts because a word indicates that it's this uh, four letter, five letter, six letter thing. It's like, no, 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 no. A concept is like huge, but there has to be a thing that you hold on to about that concept. And let me give you an example of someone I know very well. And that is myself, because believe me, <laughs> I had to figure out who I am so I could be it, especially when it comes to what I'm doing now. And for years, let me go back even further and say, why am I doing what I'm doing now? And the answer is, and why is personal branding to me so important? Well, if you're watching this live on video, you can see on my face a little bit of salt and pepper with a whole lot more salt than pepper. That's because <laughs> I'm a little bit older than your average bear. And I've been around the block a few times. And as I've gone around that block, I have been a very hardworking performer in the creative departments for a number of ad agencies or in-house operations and stuff like that. And I did what us good Midwestern people do a little too often, and that is hide our light under a bushel. Yes. I was I, the, I, I've done oh, that. I, I mean, let me tell you, you're the powerhouse mm -hmm. engine behind the wall that nobody sees. The clients that have direct access to you not only like what you do for them, but they love you because of the way you do it and the way you invite them into the creation process, the way you keep them apprised of what's going on, all that stuff. And they love you. But because you are not branded, you are nothing more than an engine in a chassis. Wow. Anybody who is a high performing wow. engine knows that engines can be unbolted and replaced anytime someone thinks there's a younger, cheaper, it'll be just as good version. And that hits you in the face hard in the form of a two by four or a baseball bat, especially after the age of 50. Wow. I hate to say it, it happened to me twice where I was absolutely loved by the people I worked with and the clients we served, but maybe the agency lost a big account. And so mm -hmm. what happens when, when an agency loses a big account? Downsize. They pull out the spreadsheet. They go mm -hmm. to the top to see who's making the most money. That's and right. They get and rid of that person go. because I can keep five of them if I get rid of one of him. Yes, I feel. Well, you. and here's the reality. That's this is what a concept I call your X years. When you reach the level in your career where you're in your X years, meaning EX, mm -hmm. you're experienced, you've got demonstrable expertise, you're expensive and therefore expendable. Wow. And all of a sudden at age 50 something, because by the way, they're going to fire you when you hit 50. If you make it to 55, they aren't going to fire you because then they could have an ageism suit. But yeah, right yeah. at 50, right at 50, they're going to look at you and go, hmm, we could let him go and we could get three people for the price of what he's doing. Hmm, let's do that. Why? Because wow. he hasn't distinguished himself as a brand. His brand within our organization is not elevating our brand. So why not just unbolt him and get a cheaper engine? Mm. It's happened to me twice. And I'm sure it's happened to many people in the audience. And that's because you did your job. That's not enough anymore. And wow. add to a layer on that, the whole artificial intelligence uh, movement or thing that's coming our way. Do you wonder? Okay. How many over the road truckers are there in the United States of America? The people who drive a load from Chicago to LA 2.7 million. Yeah. Do you think Tesla and their self-driving mm -mm. trucks are coming for those jobs? Why? Yep. Yes, they are. Yeah, they how are many, just like that. How many cashiers million. are there in the United States of America? 
2.5 million. Wow. All of a sudden we've got close to 6 million people or uh, five to 6 million people out of work because their jobs are taken over by technology. Yes. And what are we going to do now? The socially aware people will say, well, we need you universal basic income. I'm not here to fight mm. that battle. I'm here to say, if you want to have a job that is more than a job, but actually a career, you need to personally brand yourself. And again, I don't need to be Kardashian famous. I don't need to be Pat Flynn famous. Mm -hmm. I need to be famous within my immediate sphere. And by the way, when you do it right, that sphere keeps growing. Yes. I know someone named Vicki Helm who's discovered the power of live streaming and podcasting to grow her sphere all the way from a rinky dink little mountain town mm -hmm. in Colorado. Mm hmm. Huh. Why'd that happen? Because she started doing it. She pressed play on something that I'm guessing the first time you did it didn't feel all that comfortable. I <laughs> sucked. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but here's the thing. You you were faced with a geographic challenge, which was, I want to stay in Crestone, Colorado. I don't want to have to live on the front range, which I had to do, you know, I which would I be did. worse which you'd have to drive down the hill to Denver to work at the ad agency or something like that. <laughs> Forget it. Spend two hours, three hours a day in traffic. No way. Yeah. All of a sudden you were forced to build your brand so that people could know who you are, what you do and how you do it. Know why they should come to you because of what you represent and consequently seek you out and underline this part for whatever you want to charge. Because mm -hmm. brands, commodities are purchased for the lowest possible price. Brands command a premium in the marketplace, as every engineer who likes to bitch about my iPhone loves to tell me. You're paying too much for that, to which I say, uh uh uh, I'm paying exactly what I want to pay because I'm getting exactly what, I, what want. I want. I am satisfied. And by the way, what's the biggest metric or the highest metric uh, that Apple uh, actually pays attention to? customer satisfaction or customer sat. If it ever drops below 98%, Tim Cook and the entire executive team is getting together and they they actually monitor that like the gas gauge on a car going through the desert. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to mess with that customer satisfaction rating. The second it drops, heads are going to roll and things are going to change. Why? Because they know who they are. They know what they do and they know how they do it. And that's so interesting. That's so important because this part right here is the metric that we pay attention to on this show. And I know I get to be in front of the show. I'm the person that's hosting the show and everything else. But trust me, there is a huge group of people behind the show that that metric alone is the audience satisfaction, is the audience being served. The audience, that piece of clarity right there, are we serving at the highest level within our authentic message, that to me is the biggest gain any company can have. You guys, I see you going wild over here. Give me a second. There is a boatload of people here. Uh, I'm going to get a hot iron with my initials on it and brand me more later. Thank you for that. Uh, cheaper is rarely better, Charles Burton. Thank you. That is Amen. so important. Uh, that requotable for thanks, Linda. Thank you. Um, somebody said, let me in. Thank you for that. We'll be getting to you there. Uh, that let's see, let's see, sending you a link. Okay, here we go. You are speaking our language. And I really think that's so important because a lot of people, they're so taught bottom line, bottom line, bottom line, and they're not taught the sustainability piece of the bottom line. And I know Amber's on, and she's a conscious business specialist and has her own show as well. But inside that conscious business is that uh, serving with authenticity, that serving with um, the, the importance of the long-term plan. And I think this is the power of the nonfiction branding that you're talking, that nonfiction personal branding. And by the way, you guys, uh, Robin, do me a favor and go into Amazon, put the link for his book there. He's actually got a book out right now that talks about right here, nonfiction brand. 
It talks about everything we're talking about today, how to build that, how to get that show out, how to get your message out, how to go ahead and be the authentic you as you start to grow. And this is a guy who has a vast, uh, vast view of the industry. It's not some guy who's just trying to sell you into his program or sell you into, this is years and years and years of experience and why it's going to be working as well. So one is if uh, Robin, go in and get that link and put it in there because I think anybody um, look at this already. Thank you, Amber. This is a good, sweet. We will be adding this to my collection. Thank you for letting me know. The link will be in the show notes. Listen, if you're driving and you're listening on iHeartRadio or Pandora where Spotify, just relax. The links are going to be in the show notes. The links are going to be in the thread. And at the end of the show, we'll actually get to the point where we are. There it is. Here it is. Nonfictionbrand.com forward slash gift nonfictionbrand.com forward slash gift. So um, we want to be able to, we want to be able to get your branding perfect, your messaging perfect, who you are perfect in your own heart, in your own mind, because I think that builds confidence. And here's the Amazon link right there in the show notes. So you don't have to, you know, try to figure out how to look now while you're driving, drive safe, be clear. It's there for you. So we have a couple of minutes left on the show. We have about 10 minutes. If you have a question for him, you better get your question in right now because I got all the questions too I want to ask him. And uh, I, I definitely want to continue the conversation about, I want to know, it's like, when a, when let's say something happens and you're starting to gain traction and you're an authentic brand, you're a real brand and the trolls start coming, or maybe somebody's trying to cancel culture you or whatever. How is it that we can manage our brand's safety over a long period of time, maybe when there's, you know, you're being trolled or hated on or something like that. How do we manage that brand that way? Well, uh, number one, if you know who you are and it's truly who you are, you shouldn't be afraid of haters and trolls and stuff like that because they exist. Means you're doing good. Well, it, it's true because uh, there's a George Bernard Shaw quote I love to throw out there from one of his plays. The opposite of love is not hate, my dear. It's indifference. Haters hate you because lovers love you. The worst uh -huh. thing is to have people be indifferent of you. They don't have any opinion about you. Because let me tell you, I like to serve my tea hot. Sometimes people go like, ooh, that tea's too hot for me. Great. Don't want to waste your time, but mostly don't want to waste my time. If you don't like the way I do stuff, let's save each other a whole lot of time. It's like when you get old enough, the, the essence of <laughs> wisdom is just going, you know what? You don't like me. I don't like you. Let's not like each other from a distance. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just don't have time for it anymore because I know this about myself. I'm not going to change because I can't change because this is who I am. And again, my key three personally, collaborative, I have to work with people. Like I'm demonstrating it right now. I'm collaborating with uh, Vicky. Yeah, right I'm now. enjoying it. <laughs> and this audience, because the audience is a collaborator too, right? So we're collaborating. We're working together. <laughs> I'm creative, which means I'm always, I always got to be on the creative side of the fence. You're not going to get accounting from me, spreadsheets from me, analysis from me. Now I'll, I'll <laughs> take a look at all those things, but I'm not the, the little person who likes to ferret out all the stuff. I want to show me the big picture because I'll get it. I don't need to know the minutia. However, I do need a minder. I'm kind of like, a, come on, we, we have a meeting now. And that's because I'm like this all the time. I'm like a fruit fly in a, a fruit market. I'm going from bananas to strawberries to blueberries to all, they've been all over here all the time. <laughs> and that's my superpower. The opposite side of someone's superpower is their greatest weakness. I mean, Marvel has taught us that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm incredibly creative. Oh, I'm too creative because I can't focus enough for this very, very acute thing. I know that about myself. 
I'm not applying to become a surgeon ever <laughs> in my life because that person would be dead on the table because I'd be looking at the shiny object. <laughs> yeah. The third word uh, or concept, the most difficult for me to figure out, but someone came up to me one day and said, you know what you're really, really good at? I said, no, what? Tell me. You're good at pissing people off in the right way. I'm like, Ooh, what does that mean? Now that it, is it, a great skill set. Well, and, and it, he said, you, you say something that is absolutely pointing to the gorilla or the, the elephant in the room and you force people to look at it and they don't like you because of it and it makes them mad, but then you get them thinking and then all of a sudden that, that gorilla becomes this cute little cuddly capuchin monkey because it's, it's not something to be feared, it's something to be dealt with. And now all of a sudden we're moving forward as a company because you weren't afraid to say what everybody else was afraid to say. You pissed people yeah. off the right way. Now, I, I don't have that phrase as my third uh, thing in the key three. I chose to use a, syn a synonym, provocative. Ooh, I, my, I like I, that word My goal is to always be provocative. So there, you've got me in a nutshell. Collaborative, creative, provocative. The provocative was the hardest one to figure out, but it's the truest one. And I hope I've demonstrated some of that today by hopefully provoking some yeah. of your audience members to at least think more and more deeply about the challenges they're facing or the opportunities. Because keep in mind, challenges on one side of the coin, opportunities on the other. Every time you think, oh, yeah. I can't conquer this challenge, flip it and say, I'm going to look for the opportunity contained within it. And all of a sudden, yeah. you can move forward. So in the, the whole thing is the collaborative, creative, provocative. These are now that focal thing that that mm -hmm. those guardrails that we talked about that's right consequently every podcast i put out had better be provocative yeah. every piece of creative work i have collaborative to, it has to be above average mm -hmm. if not excellent because you know i i'm never to be honest creative people are never happy that's it can true. always be better yep well at least in uh, i have a concept called autopilot which is on my worst day where I'm, I kind of have a fever and backache and I've got to write some blog post or something uh, and I'm not feeling it. My autopilot level is higher than most people's. So on my worst yes. day, I'm still better than that. Yes, that's right. I now, get my goal that. is to never settle for autopilot. Mm -hmm. But some days, at least my autopilot levels better than the client because when I show them that stuff, though, they say, oh, that's good. It didn't get the, oh, my God, that's great. But at least it was good. Yes. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we can run mm -hmm. that. Yep. I I get always, you. I, I'm like a little kid coming home from kindergarten with a picture. I always want mom to put it, it up on the fridge. <laughs> if it doesn't make the fridge, uh, it could have been better. Yeah, you know? I get it. But But that's... That's I'm provoking myself to be more creative because I'm collaborating with people. Do you see how that works? Oh God, yeah. I love I love the concepts of this. I also want to pop over here. I love the concepts of this, and I want to move into story too because I just let, let me get through these right here. Amber says it takes persistence, courage to stay true to your brand, and getting to be okay with ticking people off at times along the way. Love Testify. that. Thank you for that. Absolutely. And she also says, what was your path to whittling it down to those three? Ooh, good question. What was your path? What was your process to whittling it down to those three? Thank you, Amber. Well, part of it was based on looking back at my experience, my life to date, saying mm -hmm. what things were the most successful for me, which things did I enjoy the most and were most satisfying to me? And what things do have other people indicated that, wow, you're really good at this. Mm -hmm. These are the things I paid most attention to. And that's especially when it comes to the creative part. The funny thing is, if you ask me as a young copywriter, I would not say collaboration or collaborative was mm -hmm. one of my key things because I was a ball hog. Do you remember <laughs> that being a ball hog as a kid? I was the kid with the basketball who would not pass. Because it's mine. It's my idea. If I was working with an art director on we a TV spot. We got too precious spot, with it. 
I, I wanted to spoon feed everything to the art director so that it was 100% mine. I was a real jerk <laughs> until I realized, oh, wait a minute. That art director is an art director and not a copywriter because I may be really good at words, but they're better at color type and style and our, our, the art side oh, yeah. of stuff. You know, I got to tell you. This right here is so important, what he just said about collaboration. You always hear that term, put your aces in your places. This is where you have to know yourself. Like I always tell my team, I, I suck at design. I'm great at copy. I'm great at writing. 40 books later, you're all good. But that is, that's a key thing. You can't be everything. And that collaboration piece where you realize that you were not able to share the glory with people at the time that slows down so many companies, so many brands and so many, so much productivity. Thank you for that. Thank you for that piece of that. Well, it's, it's really true because here's the thing. The, uh, the teams are what win. Yes. Unless you're a solo swimmer doing the 50 yard, you know, whatever. Michael Phelps, <laughs> even he won a plenty amount of golds on relay teams. And he for still has a team behind him, even on his solo. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and that's the key, which is all of a sudden when you realize, oh, it's not just me. It's me working with people who are better than me at yep. what they do. Amen. And Walt Disney, everyone knows about the, the plussing thing of Walt Disney, That's right. which was you take this and then you plus it. You make it a That's little better. Right. Someone else takes it, they plus it, plus it, plus it, plus it, plus it. And all of a sudden you've got this incredible thing where at the end of the day, you can't remember who came up with that idea. It's just that everyone has their fingerprints and their DNA and their blood, sweat, and tears yeah. involved with the project. And mm. everybody's just proud. I mean, uh, Love I, I think about, saying. yeah, I, I think about Pixar films and go, okay, who actually drew that? I never think that who actually, no, drew you just it enjoy it. No, I enjoy the whole thing. You're and so engrossed. Yes. And as an audience member, I'm thrilled whenever I see that Pixar name come up because I know they have the best of the best. Now, do I know the personal brands of, of everybody who did everything for that film? Of course not. But I guarantee you in their universe of they people, do. every single one of them can say, if you said, who's the best lighting mm -hmm. animator? They'll say, oh, Jim is. Mm -hmm. Or who's the best or most tasteful when it comes to color? And they'll say, oh, Jenny is. Why? Because everybody within that sphere knows what their brand is. And if they've actually built that brand person to person or demonstrated that brand externally via whatever channels you can. And here's the thing. We live in the golden age of getting your communications out there. Because yes. Vicky, I'm you. sure you know this. Yes. I can go live from my laptop via StreamYard or Restream.io to Something. all sorts of broadcast uh, things uh, to almost anybody on the face of this earth who happens to have internet access and wants to watch for free, for zero dollars. And yes, there are paid levels to everything. And, you know, StreamYard, I'm sure, yep. has paid levels and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't use the paid levels. Why? I have three daughters in college. That's where my money goes. <laughs> Does that stop me from getting off my old guy butt? Does that give me an excuse not to do these things? No. It allows me to embrace them and say, you know what? The free level of fill in the blank, whether it's LinkedIn to StreamYard to anything else, the free level is 80 to 90% of what the paid levels are for free. Once I use that 80%, 100% correctly, I'll consider paying for the extra stuff. But the main thing for me is I like to use the free levels because I'm not talking about some secret sauce. I'm talking about the stuff you go and you, you pump out of the thing and get the free ketchup at McDonald's. You can have as much of that free as you want. All you have to do is pump that thing. Social media is that thing. If yeah. you have a podcast, you've got this incredible trove of content that can be repurposed 
how many thousands of different oh, yeah. ways. And all you need is that little, you know, my phone isn't with me. Wow, that's weird. But all you need is that little, you know, iPhone and the Anchor app. And voila, the Anchor app is free and bam, you are producing. You know, I want to talk about that because if you say I can't afford or I can't do or I do any of this, that's right. There's a lot of discernment in what he just said. That's right. Thank you for that. One of the things you can is you want to be, to me, it's technology has gotten so easy. And those of you who are afraid of technology, I say this all the time. Technology has gotten easier and easier and easier because who is going to fork out money for something that gets harder and harder and harder? So we get to the point where if you, your message is more important, getting the branding of you, this is the most important piece, the piece that we're talking about now, because everything has gotten so easy. You can put that mic, that free thing in front of you and talk to your audience. And there's a statistic out right now. And I wish I could quote where that statistic came from, but it says that 3% of your audience is already looking for you. 3%. Well, I want to give you a little bit of a hint today. Our, this is big. There are 8 billion viewers of videos on Facebook every single day. 8 billion people are on looking at live videos and videos on, on, on Facebook, just Facebook, every single day. And if 3% of your audience is already looking for you in 8 billion a day, that means there's like 5 billion, 300 and something, 5 billion or a little over 5 billion people already looking for you. And let's say that you only get 3% of that 3% or forget it. Let's say you get one half of 1% of that audience, of that 5 billion audience. There are 8 billion people doing this every day. Why aren't you on there talking to your audience if you want them to find you? This is the power of having your brand correct. And listen, we have gone over the hour and I know that, but this has been such a powerful, fun conversation and I, I just want one last thing. What if they want to be involved with you? What if they want to say, hey, I want my brand to be correct, or I, I'd like a little help getting my branding. You know, where can they find you? Where can they get you? The book is already out. The link is in the description. How can they talk to you right there? Nonfiction brand, nonfiction brand on Amazon. You can go get your copy today and put it right up there. But what if they they want to talk to you or what if they want to be connected with you? Where can they find you? Well, one thing you, you can uh, connect with me every single week via the Nonfiction Brand podcast, which comes out every single Monday, featuring all sorts of guests, including people just like Vicki Helm, who have a <laughs> lot of great say, uh, things to say and share about their personal branding and small business experiences. Because again, what am I about? I'm about that nonfiction brand, that that authentic, genuine, completely true, completely you brand you already are. And that, so I'm all about that. But I do want to offer you guys the opportunity to get a free gift. There are three downloadable PDFs that you can go to nonfictionbrand.com slash gift. And there are three worksheets. One is a, uh, a first step toward developing your key three, determining Beautiful. what are the concepts that define your personal brand. But two of them are a couple of technique sheets that you can use starting right now to start building your brand via the most powerful communication tools ever known in the history of humankind, and that is social media. One's a concept I call the unselfish selfie. You'll want to read about that because it all of a sudden makes you say, selfies aren't me about me being selfish. It's my opportunity to be unselfish by making someone else look great. And what happens when that happens? I look good. If I make Vicky look great, <laughs> you look, look great. Good. If That's I shine right. a spotlight on her, some of it reflects back on me, right? Right? That's the core of the unselfish selfie idea. And the other one is called learn to love the like plus. A common like is worthless. It's garbage. It's it's a Twinkie with no nutrition. <laughs> but a like plus turns every comment into a conversation. Beautiful. And anyone who posts online wants comments to turn into a conversation because why 
algorithms, when they see that there's a conversation going on in the concepts, they then share that post wider and wider and wider. And anyone who creates content online, who do they love the most? The commenters who ask a question you betcha. For them to refer to. And then a conversation happens and people start piling in and all of a sudden you have a party. That's turn right. Every com- turn every comment into a conversation using what I like to call the like plus. Again, three PDFs, download them for free. I would di- I direct you. Uh, basically, I'm a lazy SOB, so I don't have digital products for you to buy. I don't have a course. I ask you if you'd like to join my email list, but frankly, I never send anything out to it. So don't worry about that. If you want to help me out, buy the book. If you want to talk to me, you can find me at DP Knuton, just about any place that has a handle like Instagram, et cetera. And uh, also nonfictionbrand.com or dpknuton.com. Why do I use nonfictionbrand.com? Because you can spell that. That's right. Nonfictionbrand.com forward slash gift. You get those three things today. And uh, listen, I just want to be the, just, just have the uh, links. Yes. That you can connect with him there. Nonfictionbrand.com link. We have two links up here, but it's nonfictionbrand.com link. Go get that book, go to Amazon, buy that book right now. Listen, it has been so awesome to talk with you today. I feel so grounded and so much better in the personal brand pieces. And I know my audience is jazzed right now. And so I just want to say thank you for being on the Coffee Break Show. And we will be back next week with a fabulous guest. I just want to thank you guys. And lastly, here we go with the music. We'll see you guys next week. 